Fantastic was that, right? Like that was like a moment for me. Well, here's another moment. I don't know about you guys, but I have been listening to Jeff Baxter on the radio, one way or another, my whole life. If you work in the music business, and anyone wants to demonstrate their new speakers, if anybody wants to demonstrate their PA, they want to talk about how great everything is, guess who we get to listen to? We get to listen to him, right? It's like that is the quintessential sound that we're all using as the yardstick. What a pleasure it is for Sweetwater to have him. Roland, thank you so much, Bob Bailey, for bringing Jeff to us. Big hand for Jeff Scumcaster. intro and uh, well, it's nice to be here. Just got back from three days at the Pentagon and you think the music business is weird. Right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so it is really nice to be able to get the hell out of there. Um, so I have a couple of things we're going to do today. Um, I can say I'm amazed anybody cares what I have to say so I really appreciate everybody showing up. Um, I've been a lucky boy, I've had a long, interesting life. I never thought I'd make it past 30, so this is good. This is excellent. Yeah, I was 66, I was just, uh, just showing Bobby just bought a 1966 GTO, so I thought, you know, I'd celebrate my birthday by driving it off the cliffs in Malibu. So <laughs> so, but, so today, we're going to do a couple of things. One is, uh, a little later on, I'm going to demonstrate a new Roland product called the SY300, which is a, a true synthesizer. And I, I don't know how many folks out there have ever really spent the time in the days of early synthesis when we couldn't go piano, organ, you know, bagpipes, castanets on a synthesizer where you actually had to create the waveforms to create the sounds from... Uh, from, from scratch. How many folks out there have a understanding of synthesis? Well, that's not bad. It's more than I thought. And that's a good thing. So, um, as a part of the connection to all of that, uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about physics. I'm not going to beat people up with mathematics and stuff, but we'll talk a little bit about physics because waveforms, the creation of waveforms, the manifestation of waveforms, all that stuff is the basis for synthesis also happens to be the basis for human life and the existence in the universe. You know, it's, it's not nice how all that relates together. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So God, we got the whiteboard. Um, eventually, I'm going to we'll have some fun. I'm going to find a volunteer out in the audience, and don't worry, I'm not going to humiliate you. It's not my thing. Uh, find somebody who likes to play the blues and who's you know considers that they're a blues player. And in five minutes, we'll make you sound like the most screaming bebop jazz player on the planet. That's always fun. And then just talk about playing the guitar in general. And uh, at the end, I'll take some questions. I gotta have to uh, pull chocks pretty quick after this. I've gotta get back to LA uh, after the 12:15. But I'll try to leave some time so we can, if you want, ask some questions. And since I had my nervous system surgically removed after the second Steely Dan album, you can ask me. <laughs> So, um, and I was going to talk about teaching, teaching guitar. I'm not a great guitar teacher, but every person, and how many folks out there are guitar players? Well, that's healthy. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can teach yourself how to play guitar. And that, it, that resident in your DNA is this great guitar teacher. But anyway, so, um, let's see, where should we start? Start, start from the beginning. The, uh, the guitar as we know it came from Spain. I'm sure you know that. The guitar actually originally had five strings on it when it came up from North Africa where the Moors brought it over. Somebody got smart, maybe had a little too much wine, but he put a six string on it, and this is the tuning and the instrument that we have now. Um, let's see, where should we? Well, let's do a little bit of guitar teaching. <laughs> 
You know, everybody has a guitar teacher that's resident inside them. You got it? How many people sing in the shower? You know, or sing, you know, when they're you know, planting radishes or pulling a small block out of the 57 Chevy or whatever you like to do. For, uh, um, now, you don't have a problem with that, right? I mean, you can sing anything. You can sing anything, right? Anything you can think of. Opera, you know, anything you want. But when it comes to playing guitar, you probably find it difficult sometimes to do the same thing that you can sing. Well, this is where the, is where the built in guitar teacher comes in. Um, uh, everybody familiar with uh, Oscar Peterson? Okay. Um, I'll tell you a quick Oscar Peterson story. We got Oscar Peterson a, a Jupiter 8. And uh, this was way back in the day. And we were doing a session at uh, Cherokee with Wayne Shorter and myself and uh, Eddie Gomez. And, and uh, so this is his first time that he's ever played a synthesizer. And we got a really nice patch on it and we decided to do Sweet Georgia Brown. So I don't know if you've ever seen Oscar Peterson play, but uh, he, he grunts when he plays. <laughs> but basically he's singing, you know, I mean, we're... I, you know, I, I, I know what he's doing and he's singing and it, well, I'll take 30 seconds out of the story so we'll play along, we're at Cherokee and he's playing and playing and the engineer goes like this, Oscar Peterson looks up there, we're going to run in 10 minutes, the engineer's going like this. <laughs> Finally, after about 30 minutes of this, we just kind of peters out and the engineer hits the button and says, you guys, didn't you see my signal? I was telling you that we ran out of tape. <laughs> and Oscar Peterson said the coolest thing I ever heard. He said, I know, man. I just wanted to see where it was going. <laughs> I think about that. I mean, here's, here's a guy who is probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest, jazz pianist on, ever, on the planet. And he was interested in exploring, which is kind of what you know, music is all about. But why is Oscar grunting? Well, at least like me, he's not a singer. That's why I'm in bands with people like Michael McDonald, so who can actually sing. Me, I just play the guitar. But there's something about the ability to connect your brain with your fingers. For instance, um, here's what I would suggest. Everybody has a little digital recorder or have something at home. Go home and start with simple melodies and sing a melody like, uh, I don't know. You can probably do that. And do that for about you know, a week, and then speed it up. And then maybe... Go through this, and after a while it's going to... What you're going to find is that your fingers will be able to follow the voice in your head, it will follow your, your singing voice, and then you'll be able to stop singing and just sing in your head. And you'll be able to teach yourself how to play the guitar because you have already have that software built in. And in six months, listen to what you did six months before and listen to what you're doing now and I guarantee you that you will become a much better guitar player. And the other thing that your voice does is it's not scared. I mean, we're all kind of scared so some people don't want to get outside the pentatonic scale, some people don't want to get outside the major scale because they think they can't play anything. Your voice isn't scared. When you're in the shower or you're planting tulip bulbs, you're singing all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and you're relaxed and you don't care what you're singing. You'll be amazed at how you can teach yourself how to play the guitar. You don't have to pay anybody, which is good. Unless you want to pay yourself. So, what, what, what is this thing? Um, and uh, I do a lot of work for the, for the U.S. government, mostly in stuff I can't talk about, but um, basically, um, Radar is just an electric guitar on steroids. And why is that? Well, um, you all are familiar with harmonics, right? Mm -hmm. You know what harmonics are, so you know, you know, that's, a, that's an A440. Now if you double that, it's an A to S, A to, you know, what, is it, what does 440 mean? And what does uh, 880 mean? Right? Well, 
Here we're going we're gonna to look a little bit at the, how the human ear hears stuff and plays stuff. And we're going to... Oh, I don't know, some folks probably can't see that. I don't mean to take it back to school. This is not about that. Does anybody know what that means? Yeah. Okay. Mass constant square. I'm sorry? Mass times a constant. Energy equals mass times a constant square. Constant being the speed of light. Right. So, I mean, so in, in, in essence, what does that mean? That means that if I took this guitar and accelerated to the square of the speed of light, it would turn into pure energy, right? Okay, well, why is that? You ask. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, the human being has a, a whole sensor package, as we say in the military. You know, we have the ability to access certain frequencies in certain places. For instance, uh, at zero cycles when nothing is happening at 200, minus 276 degrees Kelvin, when there's no movement, while well, nothing's going on. Uh, but have you ever noticed that all of a sudden you can feel something through your feet, maybe? You can feel like this, this vibration. You can't hear it, you can't smell it, you can't really touch it, you can't taste it, you can't see it, but you can feel it. And so when you start looking at the frequency scale up to about 20 cycles, you can't hear anything. Then after around 20 cycles, all of a sudden, the sensor package in your ear kicks in. And then you can hear, unless you're a really old guy like me, or whatever, you can hear up to about 20,000 cycles. What's a cycle? A cycle is just one time through a waveform. Peak, valley, and a complete cycle. You notice what a guitar string does? You ever looked hard at a guitar string? What does a guitar string do? Those two cycles. It's, create, it's basically creating waveforms. So our ears can hear up to about uh, 20,000 cycles. And then it drops off because we can't, we can't hear, dogs can, but we can't hear much above 20,000 cycles, although women can hear higher frequencies better than men. That's true, that's true. That's why I like male singers who are like, uh, have no, have an 8K roll off on their voice like Frank Sinatra and Michael McDonald because it doesn't irritate them. So, uh, so we're off to, uh, we're, 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 we're now we can't hear anything and we're in an area where uh, the sensor package doesn't, doesn't happen. Then all of a sudden we get up into the area of infrared. Now that, what's happening here, and that's the reason that I was asking you and talking about, about harmonics is because um, harmonics are manifestations of what we're talking about. In other words, if I if I play this note at uh, at 440, that's 440 cycles. In other words, this waveform happens in a in a particular time period at uh, 440 times a second. The same with that. That's now now we're up at 880. Okay, now. Keep that in mind because we're going to be talking about that. Now, you don't hear infrared frequencies, but you feel them. Everybody been in a tanning salon or put on one of those red lights in a bathroom or felt the heat on your arms and on your face? That's when this, the, the frequency spectrum starts to get up into this area, the infrared. And then all of a sudden, and that, by the way, that is red. And if you look at a rainbow, it goes from red to blue, right? So now you're in the, on the, on the low side of, 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 this, of this spectrum. Now all of a sudden you can start seeing things. You can see the color red. And I hate this whole thing. <laughs> Stick this up my nose. Um, you start to see the color red, the green, yellow, and then all of a sudden you get into um, the color blue. Now you've gone outside the frequency spectrum of what you can see. So our, sen our, our sensor package in our, in our bodies allows us to feel, see, and touch at certain areas. Then you're starting to get up into this area, you're starting to get up into the gigahertz range, microwave ovens, radars, et cetera, et cetera, and that stuff just disappears. Um, now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I remember when I was in Kosovo, where the Russians were on one end of the runway and the Americans were on the other, and they didn't have a lot of food, but we did catch a couple of rabbits, so, uh, they put the rabbit in a wooden cage, put it in front of a MiG-25, turned on the radar, cooked them in about two minutes. So, 
it, there's stuff happening up there. <laughs> now the reason that I the reason that I I'm, I'm laying this out is because I want to to help you relate to what music is in terms of physics. Um, I guess what you could say is that vibration vibration is the same as 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 um, uh, resonance, the same as anything where something is moving and creating a waveform is the glue that holds the universe together, basically. It's what holds things together at the molecular level, the atomic level, and the subatomic level. So if I take 440, which is A, um, below middle C, if I take 440, multiply that times 10 to the 22nd power, times a spooky little number that's a piece of Planck's constant, I get the color green. So what does that mean? That means that green is a super, super, super harmonic of the note A440. All of this is in a linear fashion. Finally, it gets up to the point where this turns to that. It, the, vib the vibration becomes so, uh, so fast and goes to such a state that it becomes pure energy. So the, reason that I, the only reason that I brought this up is because when you play music, basically what you're doing is you are becoming sort of at one with the universe. And I don't mean to sound hippy dippy. I did grow up in the 60s, but I still have a brain. Um, that's uh, music is a manifestation of physics. That's what it's all about. Uh, now people wonder why does why does music uh, affect you? Why do they, why do they call it the blues? Well, when you start looking at a pentatonic scale and you multiply it times these numbers, you get into the blue part of the spectrum. I know it's weird, but it's, <laughs> it's true. Um, now, what music and vibration, combinations of such, um, um, affect your mood, for instance. Does anybody know what the devil's interval is? Right. Devil's interval was something that the Catholic Church and I don't, I'm not going after the Catholic Church, that the Catholic Church decided that if you played and put that in any kind of music, they would do very nasty things to soft parts of your body for long periods of time until you said, oh, I'm sorry, I'll never do that again. It's an interval with a dominant and a flat five. In other words, the fifth of the, of the, of the, the E and a B, for instance, the five and the one, flat the five. Now, if I play this for you guys, everybody's happy. You can listen to that for a while. Probably. How long can you listen to this? Enough. Why is that? Because when you stack the harmonics of both of these notes, they're odd harmonics. They don't come up evenly. We love even harmonics. stacks of even harmonics. We don't like odd harmonics. And so it changes our, it actually vibrates our DNA in such a way as to make us angry. Of course, uh, uh, Bach figured that out, and when he wrote uh, Bach's Toccata and Fugue in D minor, which you've heard in every, every Dracula movie you've ever seen, they probably should have played it in the end of the church service because they burned the church to the ground. And so, um, Stravinsky goes, oh yeah, I love that. You know, I'm going to write this piece of music called, uh, you know, the Rite of Spring. Oh, I like that. So I'm going to have cellos and violas go. Wow. So everybody said, yeah, that's really cool, and they looted six blocks of downtown Paris. <laughs> But why is because music, as you all know, has a direct effect on people's emotions. And when you score movies, I don't know if any, any of you have done any movie scoring, but it's a, it's a fascinating uh, uh, endeavor because you basically can whipsaw people's, uh, people's emotions. So, um, you know, let's see, you know, Jane's dog died.
okay? Your emotions are following right along with this. And why? Because we as human beings have learned to manipulate the frequency spectrums in ways that we can actually affect people's feelings. Um, the way we affect people's feelings is that we stimulate certain parts of the human brain to secrete certain substances. And I know this is a terrible thing, but we are all drug addicts. <laughs> because we are addicted to vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, adrenaline, all the drugs that our brain secretes to create the moods and the feelings that we call emotion. Now, I don't want to get into a philosophical uh, discussion between, you know, are we creatures of free will or not? That's a whole other, you know, Nietzsche versus Stendhal versus, yeah, that's a whole other thing. But uh, that's how that works. In essence, we have a machine that has triggers. The triggers are vibrations. Vibrations trigger the machine to secrete and create certain chemicals, which tell us how we're supposed to feel. So as musicians, you have a very, very powerful tool to be able to get into people's hearts. And now I'm not gonna get political, but one of the reasons when I first went over to Afghanistan was because when I heard that the Taliban was cutting the hands off of musicians, that pissed me off. And I thought, there's a, I, I think there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is there, you know, and I'm not gonna get into religion versus religion, but that particular religion believes that if you, if you die, you go to that big Playboy mansion in the sky forever. And, and I know about that, I used to, fall asleep in the grotto on Thursdays and wake up on Tuesdays. <laughs> Good news is I was not going to drown because I was surrounded by flotation devices. I made sure that I wouldn't you know, go and lose my oxygen supply. But, be that as it may, the reason that the Taliban was doing that is, again, they're not afraid of bullets. What they're afraid of is somebody that can get into somebody's heart. Musicians, artists, but especially music, is the key to opening up people's emotions, as we just showed. That's what, that's what they're frightened of. So that's one of the reasons why I got involved in that game, but that's a, again, that's a whole other story. You have the key. You have the key, and it's fantastic. It's an incredible gift. Uh, how many folks out there are, you, I assume pretty much all of you are musicians, and I assume that sometimes you enjoy just playing by yourself. Uh, taking control of your own emotions. I mean, whether you sit down and read a novel or whatever it is, some people run because they like the adrenaline, but some people like to sit down and play music because, it, uh, for me, I know it, I can change my moods, I can change my life. So, the physics part of this is the fact that you are creating the tools, you have the tools to create the capability to, to uh, influence brain secretion, which is the essence of life. You know, um, I don't know how many of you took acid in the 60s, but as you know, that there are other parts of the universe that um, are not part of your normal consciousness, but music can take you there. Music can take you to pretty much any place. So, that said, um, what I'd like to do for fun is in, in, the, in the spirit of, of teaching guitar, I'd like to find a... Uh, uh, a volunteer from the audience who, who's a blues player. I'm sorry? Uh, whomever. Where we, have, we have nominations. Uh, let's see, we may have to have a question here where we can decide who can... Uh, uh, what's the latest model of the F-15? E. E? Yeah. You win. I'm not a blue player. Oh. <laughs> I, love, I love fire blues. That's it. What's a gross takeoff weight of the B2? You're not supposed to know. Um, uh, there's a gentleman back there. You can't keep pointing to him. Uh, come on up, sir. <laughs> Uh, probably, probably. <laughs> um, so grab the guitar, plug it in. It should be plugged in. And see if it's on. If not, we'll have to. Oh, there we go. Okay. Great. 
Um, what we're going to do now is, is look at, the, at the, the concept of chords versus melodies. Um, I was a big Ventures fan when I was a kid because when I heard a band that actually played melodies on the guitar, I'm like, wow, that's kind of interesting, you know, as opposed to the, the, the two finger solo. These guys were actually playing melodies. You know? Yeah, one of the great songs that the Ventures did. So here's what we're going to do. Um, there's a kind of a rule of thumb. If you want to make music accessible, you, you, there are kind of two things to look at. One is either use complicated chords and simple melodies, or if you want to use complicated melodies, you probably have to use simple chords. So what we're going to do, just sort of an experiment, and I promise it's not going to make you look bad at all. I'm just going to do a quick, like a, you know, 12 bar blues in A for a second. You play lead. stuff we were playing. So complicated chords, simple simple melodies. So thank you very much for being hey. my dedicated hey. That wedding gig tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> a, a casual. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So let's see, what else can we do? Um, actually, I'll take a couple of questions now if you want, because it, it helps get me out of my brain. Sir. Hi, Doug. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Oh, well, thank you. I've listened to your classes for a long time. Well, amazing anybody cares what I have to say. Thank you. I saw you at the Chicago Stadium in 77. How long have you had the mustache? How long have I had the mustache? Yeah. Since I was 18. Okay. I went to prep school and I did everything I could to escape that <laughs> prison. And growing a mustache was helpful. And then why did you choose the stool? Okay, stool. Uh, back in 63 and 64 when I was working at uh, Jimmy's Music Shop at Dan Armstrong's store on 48th Street in New York, um, my job was, you know, we were repairing and customizing guitars. And a lot of great guitar players were there. As a matter of fact, um, I was like the little snot nosed kid. The reason that I learned to play bass lines with chords, like. Yeah.
because unbelievable players like Sam Brown and Eddie Deal, I mean, they were hanging around the store all the time, the best beboppers in New York. And so my job was to play an old wrench guitar with two bass strings and just play the chords with them. these guys could like, you know, burr. So uh, one day, uh, Andre Segovia came into the store. He was playing at Carnegie Hall and he had a Ramirez, beautiful Ramirez and one of the machines had cracked. So uh, I got the job and, you know, I, I, I repaired it for him. And uh, outside in the front room, Frank Zappa and Mike Bloomfield and a bunch of other guys used to hang out there. Uh, we're all playing, and they're all standing around with you know their guitars on, and you know playing all kinds of music. And then uh, I, I brought the guitar up to Andres to go in. I grew up in Mexico, so I speak fluent Spanish. Uh, and it says, uh, "Señor, profesor, su, su guitarra está listo, por favor, trátalo, por favor." And um, so he 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 looked at all of us with this weird look. I said, "I go up to Rio and you know, is there a problem?" He says. You guys are idiots. <laughs> right? You don't hang it around your neck like a canoe paddle. <laughs> and I thought, you know, okay. And then of course, <laughs> then he sits down and plays. And he plays the first 64 bars of the Concerto de Aranjuez from Rodrigo and we're going, okay, I guess this man knows what he's sitting, he's sitting down and playing the instrument. And I started to play that way and I realized, you know, that, that is the way to play the guitar, actually the way to play the guitar. I went, used to watch the Lawrence Welk show when I was a kid. I used to watch Speedy West and Thumbs Carlisle. If I had it to do all over again, you probably all remember the great Jeff Healy, he's a wonderful guitar player. There's something about the stretch this way that you don't get this way and I think that's probably the way I would have done it. But barring that, Andre Segovia is right. Sit down and play the instrument because it's, there's something about the, the, person, the, the, the person of it against your body and also the fact that when you, when you look at uh, how your fingers hit the, hit, hit the neck on the, uh, and, the, and the strings, it seems real natural. I mean, I'm not putting anybody down, but I'm having a hard time figuring out how you really get really good chords when you've got, you know, balanced on your kneecap. I mean, it looks good. I got no problem with that. It looks, you know, a lot of that. But for me, playing the instrument is up here. And that's why Mr. Segovia convinced me very quickly. That's true, sir. What were some of your favorite things playing with Steely Dan and some of your favorite songs? Favorite things? How about working with them? <laughs> My favorite things was we did a song called East St. Louis Tootaloo, Absolutely. which was the Duke, uh, uh, Duke Ellington tune. Actually, it was written by Billy Strayer, but it was the Duke Ellington tune. And um, so we said, okay, we're going to have some fun. Why don't we take a song? Everybody will pick a part and we'll play that part. So Walter wanted to use the, the, the mouth box, the voice box, to do the, the, the melody. And so I thought, what? okay, I'm going to do the trombone part, but I'm going to do the trombone part of Pedal Steel. So wrote it all out, and we ended up doing, which to me is a great classic piece of music, and having a lot of fun with it. I mean, the good thing about pedal steel is you can get in between notes, you can slide up to notes, so to me it was the perfect candidate for the trombone part. That was fun. Uh, doing a, a couple of beer commercials in Spanish, that was fun. Um, I just enjoyed playing with the band. It was, the music was challenging. And since we were all studio rats anyway, it was, that wasn't a problem. You know, the actual um, uh, execution of it, uh, it, it, it could get a little, uh, be a bit of an anathema. I mean, when it took six weeks to get a bass drum sound, you know, at 300 an hour, but okay, you know, people do, do things differently. So I enjoyed playing with the guys, I enjoyed playing with the band, and Jimmy Hodder, who's a drummer, uh, was a good friend of mine from Boston, unbelievable drummer. So it was, uh, I had a good time. It was challenging, and challenging is good. That's why I became a studio musician, because I like the idea of, uh, you know, the challenge. As a matter of fact, um, when I was playing with the Doobies, uh, I wore headphones on stage because, number one, I wanted to be able to keep my hearing. And number two, to me, playing in a 50,000-seat hall was 
it's like being in the studio. You sit on the stool, you play. You know, you know, it may not be a chart, but you, you know, you're playing the guitar. So I want to get a nice mix and let everybody else jump on the trampolines and stuff like that. <laughs> but again, you know, everybody has a way of doing things. Um, so the problem wearing headphones is people have access to you. So as I'm, you know, trying to listen to them, taking it to the streets and stuff like that, the guys out uh, at the monitor console are putting porn movies and the baseball star stories and all kinds of stuff in the headphones. I'm trying to concentrate. And play. So Tim McCormick, who was one of the guitar techs, in, in the midst of, I think it was, uh, Keeps You Running, uh, came out and, and put a piece of paper in front of me and it said, The King and I. I said, what's that? He said, so we played this game where every night somebody would write a song out that I had to solo over, use that piece of music for the solo. So, you know. So it turns out that... So every night, you know, when we'd be playing, I'm rocking down the, you know, rocking down the highway. It's gonna be hot. You know, with like, you know. But they wanted, and they wanted to hear, you know, gaze and joy of, joy of, 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 of believing. So. To me, that's that was the, that was the fun times because it was a challenge. It was always a challenge. I love classical music. I grew up went to classical piano for eleven years, and, which I highly recommend to anybody who's a musician take piano lessons. So those were you know, kind of the high points, you know, chainsawing up the hotel rooms with Joe and stuff like that. It was fun too. <laughs> but, but good musical moments. Really enjoyed it, and really enjoyed um, helping the Doobies move from being a great rock and band into being able to uh, create a record like um, Minute by Minute. You know, it was, it was fantastic. These guys in that band were just great musicians. Ty Rand was probably the most underrated bass player on the planet. That guy is frightening how good he is. And it was interesting to hear Keith Knudsen, who was a wonderful drummer, you know, when we were doing Taking It to the Streets album, we were having a good time and we were, you know, rocking along. And then when we were doing um, uh, Minute by Minute, he says, you know, I. I dropped the snare drum beat in bar 56. Uh, I, I rushed, I rushed the, the two. I was thinking, okay, now, now we're getting somewhere. Because I was taking the band and, and forcing, forcing, not forcing them, they didn't do gunpoint, but I said, now you guys are a studio band. You're gonna go in and work on Richie Haven's albums, Leo Sayer albums, Carly Simon albums. You're gonna show up at nine o'clock in the morning and don't give a damn what band you're in. Downbeat is at nine, you play it right or you're fired. And it was amazing how these musicians rose up to the occasion and started to develop. That was, for me, that was fun is watching these guys dig deep into how capable they were. And that was probably the most fun I had with the Doobie Brothers is watching that transition. Anyway, uh, sir. Yes, obviously with your accomplishments, what keeps you entertained as a musician? <laughs> what keeps me entertained as a musician? What? Um, well, some of it is exploring areas that I've never explored. I, on my bucket list was nobody's ever played Pound of Steel with a choir and an orchestra. So at the Kennedy Center last Christmas, they allowed me to play with a choir and an orchestra to do Oh Holy Night on Pound of Steel. And then um, the deal was they'd let me do that if I would do Stille uh, Nacht, which is Silent Night, which was written in 1799 by Hans Gruber. On, on the guitar, and we did the original version of it. But stuff like that, that's what keeps me entertained, trying to figure out um, how music can help. Um, I guess I guess you could call it entertainment. We were up on the Thai-Burma border bringing refugee kids across from uh, Burma. Uh, it had been a long day, a uh, long day meeting, things had gotten pretty busy. And you're, you're in a foxhole trying to keep the kids' heads down, stuff's getting you know, getting off, it's going tactical, but a long day. Afterwards, we went back into the refugee camps with the kids, and they were like frightened. And what are you going to do? There's like 3,000 refugees, um, very little food, but you know, they're, they're, you want to bring the spirits. And somebody brought me a guitar made out of a cigar box with five strings on it. 
So we taught the kids how to do Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And was it a great concert? No. It's probably one of the most meaningful things in my life because be able, they'd be able to get those kids out of that headspace. And we were in a firefight for two hours and get those kids out of that headspace and calm them down and, and watching them have fun. So to me, music is the, it just is the key that opens every, every door there is. So that's how I keep myself entertained. And I also like to watch TV and play music along the TV because it's, it, it's ear training. As soon as you hear a jingle, you want to get, uh, you want to It helps you with your ear training because you are, it's like in the studio, you got one shot, you may only, they may even uh, give you a piece of music, but they may sing the piece of music, sing what you want, and you only got one shot. It's, it's good training. Yeah, I remember we were doing, I used, to, I used to sleep on the couch at Universal in Chicago doing jingles. We do like seven jingles a day. I fly in from LA, you know, and, 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 and sleep on the couch, do seven a day, go back to sleep, wake up at seven in the morning, we'd be going again. And on Friday, the guy that I met who's working with me now, CJ Vanston, on my solo project with me, an unbelievable keyboard player, was one of the guys in the studio band. And so the, the guy who, uh, the, the guy who was the head of the Jingle House, and I'm not going to name names, but it's not fair, uh, he came in on Friday and he was fried. I mean, I had been up for like three days. He'd probably been uh, uh, heavily into uh, the Devil's Dandruff, you know, the, uh, what are they, that Egyptian stuff, the Toot Uncommon, or whatever, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, pretty, it was pretty frazzled. So he comes in and says, all right, you guy with this is a Hyatt, Hyatt, Hyatt Hotel. So uh, are you guys ready? I go, yeah, yeah, sure, I was ready. So he puts the music in front of us. It's got a time signature. It says it's in the key of G and it's got 64 <laughs> bars and that's it. So the guy's ready? I go, yeah, sure. So we just started making shit up, you know, <laughs> and, and, and playing it and, and the client's going, because <laughs> he was a cello player in high school, so he's a real expert, you know. Um, things like, I really like what you guys are doing, but we we have to raise the tempo up one octave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, hey, that's part of being a studio musician is being around, you know interesting levels of uh, intellectual whatever. So, um, music it opens amazing doors. I mean, it opened doors for me at, when I went to Lawrence Livermore, when we first started working on the Missile Defense Program. Fast Eddie Teller. Does anybody know who Edward Teller was? Invented the hydrogen bomb. Unbelievable, unbelievable scientist. Brilliant guy. He's also a concert pianist. Einstein, violinist. Brian May, does anybody know who Brian May is? Oh, yeah. PhD. Well, you know he got his doctorate theory in astrophysics. Right. Uh -huh. Actually, I'm trying to hire him over at Livermore because he's a very smart guy. What do all these <laughs> folks have in common? Music. Right, and so there's, uh, I'll just, I, I know you want me to more to talk, but I will tell you something because a very special man passed away about, about four months ago, Charlie Towns. You probably wouldn't know who Charlie Towns is, but Charlie Towns got the, won the Nobel Prize for inventing the laser. Laser is basically coherent light. What that means is if you stuff enough of a particular frequency together in a, in, where it's in phase, and you all know what phase is, right? When t two waveforms are very close to each other. That's how you tune guitars. Like Hear, when you hear this, you hear the beating, right? As we get it closer in phase, it begins to lock co and becomes coherent. So that's what a laser is, basically one particular frequency that's all put together. So Charlie, we were in a meeting with uh, my job at, at Livermore sometimes on the technical review committee was to we had to review all the programs, and I got to tell you, it's four days long, and after the second day of femto laser peening, peening in a pure hydrogen atmosphere, and yeah, eye water crap. So Charlie got up and said, "I'm going to take a break." 
I'm going to take, I'm going to give a talk on the con, on the connection between theoretical physics and God. So we all woke up and said, yeah, this is a good thing. Go out of Charlie. Charlie said something that was very interesting. He said, I said, what's the human spirit? He said, well, it's a set of coherent oscillations because he, coherency in physics is what we talked about before in terms of, of laser. And he said, the human spirit is what's connected to your body when you die. You still have the resonance. In other words, if I play, it disappears in this room, but it doesn't disappear in the universe. It resonates. In other words, it keeps on, the waveform keeps on propagating throughout what we know, know as the universe. Charlie said that's what happens when you pass away, that your spirit, which is a set of coherent oscillations, keeps on resonating. I thought that made some good sense. But I said, Charlie, coherent oscillation is what music is. He said, bingo. The human spirit is absolutely fundamentally connected to music. That is the manifestation of it. That's why we make music, is to connect to our spiritual peace. Anyway, that's why I like playing music. You know. Plus, I mean, I made some good money at it. You know, I got to buy a GTO. <laughs> Keep my daughter in shoes, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, anybody have another, another question? What is your science background that brought you to Livermore and, and Senegal? I mean, nothing. Obviously, obviously you have a good No, I mean, really, nothing. I mean, my science background is when I was a kid, since in Mexico, nobody knew how to fix amplifiers. They started learning which way electrons move by sticking a knife in a toaster and you figure out, okay, I get that, I know why, I, I, I get that, I understand the physical ground state. But it has to be more than listening to Venus flycraft, so. Well, what happened was, is because I, I work with Roland on a number of projects, and we, I've been with Roland for 41 years, we started with the guitar synthesizers. Um, I had a, all guitar players, as I'm sure you all, who are guitar players, you're all diode heads, you can't, Anything that goes into, goes out of, lights up, buzzes, clicks, somehow does something you want to plug in, you want to figure it out. So it takes you into the world of the electron. And I started reading, um, uh, well, step back, uh, mud slides where I was living, the guy, a little gentleman down the street, uh, his garage was full of mud, I helped him t uh, clear it out. He took me into his study and had pictures of airplanes on the wall. He was one of the guys who invented the Sidewinder missile at China Lake. So he gave me a, a subscription to Aviation Week in Space Technology. I started reading it, started being more interested in the science, started realizing that there were some applications to that, to musical instruments, especially when we started doing digital, simple digital storage, because the military was doing that for years. And when they were moving from analog to digital, the, all the science was there. So I started getting into it. I wrote a paper on how to convert a Navy weapon system to do theater missile defense on a mobile platform from NATO, gave it to a congressman buddy of mine, who had congressman to Dana Rohrbach, who was basically my job was to keep his ass from getting shot off in all these terrible places we went around the world. Because I did 15 years with LAPD as well. So <laughs> Dana gives it to the vice chairman of the Armed Services Committee, he says, what? This, is, this guy with Raytheon, Boeing? I said, no, he's a guitar player for the Doobie Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I got a call from the Armed Services Committee saying, uh, would you be willing to, uh, to, to come on to the Armed Services Committee as a, as a consultant uh, on missile defense? I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. What does that mean? Of course, I found out what that means. I'm strapped into a chair, they're asking me about, you know, all kinds of terrible stuff about my private life. But <laughs> that's how it started. And then I ended up uh, getting heavily involved in missile defense. Because again, understanding this, you know that uh, radar is an electric guitar on steroids. All you're doing is upping the, f the, uh, the, the frequency range. Um, if this, if this thing vibrates fast enough, we could cook that, cook that rabbit. <laughs> so, so that's how I got into it. And the good news is I was around smart people. I mean, uh, uh, again, Charlie Towns, Edward Teller, uh, Mike Campbell. I mean, these, these guys are brilliant physicists, and so a little bit rubs off on you. And uh, also they allowed, when I went to NGA, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, I, w I took the radar courses, which is interesting enough, Tom Agar, who taught the radar course, started it off with Bach, Beethoven, Pink Floyd, because he wanted people to understand the relationship between frequency, music, and things that we could relate to. So anyway, I had great teachers. You know. Thank you.
Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing your dad back there. It's uh, just to put a footnote off what he just said, the auto tune stuff you buy in the back here, that technology was taken from the underground petroleum exploration. Oh, yeah. I mean, it, we're, when we're, we're building, and I mean, the unclassified part of this is we're building a complete virtual immersive uh, intelligence analytical holodeck. And much of that technology came from the oil and gas business. They make money off of it, so I, we know it works. Um, Have you ever watched The Big Bang Theory? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I saw it on, on the airplane once because I ran out of stuff to read. Uh, it, actually, it, it's, a, it's a very well-written show, you know. It's not my kind of show, but it's well written. Pardon? You understand Sheldon a little bit more than that. Well, I understand Sheldon because one of my colleagues in the intelligence business, his son is 15 and he just graduated from MIT. And this kid is fierce. You know, he writes code for uh, simulating nuclear weapon detonations at 15. So, yeah, I kind of understand. I can kind of relate to that. I love kids like that. And we're teaching them how to play piano. Uh, sir. What players do you like that are playing today? Playing today? Yeah, active players. Well, I walked into a club in Austin many, many years ago and heard this kid named Eric Johnson playing guitar. Yeah. And uh, so I said, ah, oh, sure, I can get this guy a record deal in a New York second. It took five years because the record business just can't find his butt with both hands. But, um, he's a brilliant guitar player. I love the way he plays. Um, uh, uh, Trey Anastasio, I really like his guitar playing. Yes. We went to the same prep school, and that's weird. He's much younger than I am. But I like people that improvise and aren't afraid. He's, he's not as nuts as Ornette Coleman, who, by the way, passed away a few days ago, God rest his soul. But uh, he's an improviser, and I like where he's going. Jeff Beck is probably the greatest guitar player, electric guitar player on the planet. You never know where he's going. Uh, unlike some other well-known guitar players who are masters of the obvious, you just never know where Jeff is gonna go. So I think he's a wonderful, wonderful guitar player. My, my favorite guitar player of all time is Howard Roberts. I don't know if any of you know about Howard Roberts, but you can look him up and you can listen to some of the stuff he played. Uh, my dad, who had a friend who was a DJ, gave me all the first two Howard Roberts records when I was 11 years old. It changed my life. I mean, I couldn't believe what you could do how you can play jazz guitar and be on fire at the same time. And Howard and I ended up becoming really good friends um, because we were both teaching at the Guitar Institute of Technology. And he was friends with Tommy Tedesco and Tommy and I used to do the Tommy and Jeff show where we'd dress up in tutus and come out and play music on the you know, rock and roll on the way. Studio business in LA is a weird, weird business. Anyway. But um, Howard Roberts, we gave him a guitar synthesizer and again, the same thing, not frightening. And his son, Jay, unbelievable guitar player too. I don't know if you ever get to the NAMM show in, in LA, but if you do, um, uh, on the second night of the NAMM show, they do a whole evening with guitar players. Myself, Dennis Budimir, it's all killer studio guys, and Jay's probably one of the best guitar players I've ever heard. Um, sir, sure. Um, when you talk about the um, the Sierra Nevada How would I, how would I? Well, that's a hard, that's a hard thing because everybody has a, you know, personal interpretation of the Mona Lisa, personal interpretation of when they listen to I'm so lonesome I can cry. It does different things for different people. <coughs> I like the fact that he approaches things from the side. Um, again, what we were doing before is, okay, we could play the blues or we could use the blues. We could have that as a starting point and start exploring around it. That's why I think, that's why I like my latest guitar playing. I'm looking to the side of what he's playing all the time. I mean, that's the way I see it. You're probably saying, what the hell does that mean? It's like saying everybody has their own interpretation or something. I'm sorry? I think that's how I would describe it, I don't know how to play Yeah. I think I, I look along the side lobes of what he's playing. He suggests so many things, which is good because that makes your mind work and that's what good musicians are supposed to do. 
I think we're going to do one more question, and then um, I'm going to want everybody to stay in your seat. And we'll oh, that's right. We have to do the ah, rats. So don't Sorry, worry about I'm, that, Jeff. I, I apologize. No, nope, don't worry about I'll that. Let me do this, and then I'll take one, one awesome. more question. Go for it. I'm sorry about that. Man, you get off on this stuff, and next thing you know, you're out by the work cloud. Anybody know what the work cloud is? It's the asteroid belt outside the, the orbit of Pluto. Yep. Interesting place. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> this is a cool puppy. Okay, and, and actually, I know I don't have a whole lot of time, but for those of you who haven't spent a lot of time doing synthesis, we're just going to give you the basic lesson in synthesis. There are four waveforms. Four versions of this. One is this, which is called a sine wave. One is this, which is called a triangle wave. One is this, which is a reverse triangle wave. And one is this, which is called a square wave. And all of you who have fuzz tones and distortion devices, you know what a square wave is. These are the waveforms that are used to create sound, which we just showed you. I mean, that's when we create, you know how an electric guitar works, right? You vibrate a piece of metal inside a magnetic field and you create a current, uh, wrap with a coil and you create a current. So basically all you're doing is you're creating a waveform using the string, the waveform creates a waveform that's amplified. Um, now, you, you know what, when you listen to a flute, that waveform is a sine wave. It's kind of pure sounding. When you listen to, you know, a, a, a distorted, you know, when you listen to satisfaction or something, that's a square wave. If you listen to a, bar, to a chorus effect, it's a dry signal and a triangle wave. On the other side, it's stereo, and your brain puts it together and creates a kind of moving, oscillating, um, slight pitch change. Then, when you take these waveforms, you have to do something with them. So then you have to put them through a filter. And a filter is basically, we're talking about zero to light, let's you know, they go from 20 to 20 kilohertz, in other words, 20 cycles per second to 20 kilohertz. Where do you decide that you're gonna, you're gonna alter the sound? Do you want to cut it off here? So do you want the, 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 the frequency spectrum to look like this? Do you want to cut it off here? Do you want it to look like this? Do you want to only take a particular part of that and amplify it? So what a filter does is just like a coffee filter, instead of filtering coffee grounds, what it does is it filters particular parts of the frequency spectrum. Then there's an envelope generator, which is kind of like the way your mouth works. If uh, if I go, hey, how are you? My mouth is an envelope generator, which is forming the sounds coming out of my mouth. If I go, way wow wow woo, I'm also creating an envelope effect on how I affect the frequencies that are coming out of my mouth. Uh, and you can electronically do that with this, uh, with, with the, uh, uh, the envelope generator. So what, what Roland has done, and these guys, this is awesome. They figured out a way to, to allow you to do true synthesis with nothing else than plugging the guitar into, the, uh, into this box. Because this has, and we don't have a camera, so I can't show you, but this has all the building blocks of a, of a synthesizer that, that all of you synthesis guys and gals, and as Liberace would say, uh, well, I left anybody out. Uh, uh, hey, gotta be politically correct out there. So. Um, all the tools that you need to actually create uh, sound. So I'm, th I'm just gonna play this patch here. Now that's, there's no, there's no latency. There's no guitar involved in this at all in terms of the pickups. This is all being generated from three oscillators created with three different sine waves, all slightly detuned. I mean, if you know, anybody ever, um, Remember Clockwork Orange? <laughs> Sound familiar? It's pure synthesis. So, I, you know, I, I, I'm a little, I'm just trying to figure out how to explain this because I can't, I can't show you what's going on in here, but it's for the heck of it. Um, 
I have three oscillators. I have three, an oscillator is a, is a machine that creates a waveform. It's like a sausage machine. You put stuff into it, out comes, you know, stuff that you make sausages with, so. actually allow you to create sounds from the basic building blocks of sound. Um, I don't know how many of you are, are synth players. Uh, any, anybody play the guitar synth? Any guys in? Yeah, an amazing machine, right? Ever since we took six take heads and stuck them under some, some, some strings and created the guitar. This was back with Roller many, many, many years ago. Um, GR500 actually did that. That was the last, this is kind of the GR500 on steroids. So I urge you, not because I work for Roland, because I love Roland and I've been with them for many years, but this is way too much fun. And also as a guitar player, you, know, you talk about opening up horizons. The ability to be able to play you know, music. I'm gonna turn this off for a second. Let me boot it up. Um, again, to be able to have the opportunity, and by the way, it's polyphonic. <laughs> What an amazing machine. And by the way, it follows, tracks everything, tracks everything that you play. Um, I just highly recommend this if he's, he's a, again, all guitar players are all gearhead, diode kind of crazy people. This is a diode head dream. This thing is, plus it has all the effects. It has chorus and reverb and, and um, it's basically a built-in fun machine. Uh, I, I, sometime, next time we demonstrate it, I, I need to get, a, I guess, maybe a camera on here so you can see what I'm doing. I, I apologize for it. What's the bottom line, Jeff? Bottom line? Yeah. Go buy one. <laughs> You're gonna love it. I'm serious. I, 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 I'm gonna have to give this up, but you know, maybe. But <laughs> it's yours, man. It's okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. Uh, actually, I'm requisitioning it for the Department of Defense. <laughs> we want to go cook rabbits, um, which actually you can do with this. If you hook this up to a traveling wave too. You can cook a rabbit. <laughs> yeah, playing you know, Beethoven with six. Anyway, um, how are we doing for time here? Oh, we're wrapping up. Yeah, we're, listen, I'm sorry I didn't get to play. My time goes by. I, I really apologize. Thank you so much for coming. I hope I didn't disappoint you. <laughs> Does it take a special pickup? No, it does not. So, you want to get a closer look at the SY300? That's it is out in the Roman tent. Uh, we have it set up. You guys can take a look at it. And uh, it, it is truly amazing. It's a groundbreaking piece. It's the first time we've been able to do polyphonic synthesis just simply by plugging in a guitar. So, it's pretty cool. Two things. Um, unfortunately, Jeff has to make a really, really tight flight. So, um, He's not going to be able to stick around afterwards. Uh, we have to get him to the airport almost immediately, and I, I appreciate your, uh, your understanding. Uh, secondly, there are cards on the chair, on each individual chair, and uh, Sweetwater would appreciate it if you would fill them out um, and hand them to the, uh, the folks on the way out the door. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much for showing up. Jeff, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Have a good day.